Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Aaron Muir. I uh, work at Quonsite, and today I'm going to be telling you about the Python Array API standard. So, uh, yeah, when you uh, hear arrays in Python, first thing you think of, of course, is NumPy. And uh, we all know NumPy is great. It's sort of been the backbone of this entire ecosystem for um, well over uh, you know, a decade and a half. And obviously the reason for that is this uh, great um, suite of tools and libraries that have been built out using the NumPy uh, library and the NumPy array. Um, and you know, this has been great, but if we look at what the ecosystem looks like today, um, it looks a lot more like this. There's a lot of different array libraries, not just NumPy. There's QPy, there's Jax, there's PyTorch. And each of these array libraries has their own little ecosystem of tools that have been built on these arrays. And so if you're using NumPy, uh, you kind of look like this. You're, you can still use this great ecosystem of NumPy libraries, but you can't really access things like QPy or PyTorch. Um, something like this will happen, for example, if you try to pass a QPy array uh, to SciPy. And keep in mind that QPy is about as close as you can get to NumPy without actually being NumPy. Uh, but you get this error. Um, and so ideally, we would like to have this. We would like to be able to use matplotlib and SciPy and scikit-learn with QPy or with PyTorch. Um, and so what, what's really the problem here? Well, the problem is that SciPy and all these other tools, they're, they're using import NumPy. And their code is all coded against NumPy, and it's assuming uh, NumPy functions. Um, and so we can ask, you know, how might we go about uh, solving this problem? And there's a few things that you might think. Uh, you know, the most obvious thing is, well, why do we have all these libraries? Why, let's just merge everything back into NumPy. Well, you know, obviously these libraries, you know, they exist separately from NumPy for a reason. They all have their own sort of uh, strengths. Um, they, they support, you know, different hardware, uh, different, uh, you know, they have different uh, um, reasons for existing. And this is this would be way too much scope for NumPy. Um, another solution you might say is, okay, well, maybe we won't merge everything to NumPy, but could, we could at least sort of, you know, copy the NumPy API, which is uh, sort of the QPy approach. Um, but the problem here is that NumPy was designed a long time ago, and it's designed around a certain, a very specific model of eager CPU computation. And a lot of these semantics that are built into NumPy are, they're really just inappropriate for a lot of these other use cases, such as GPUs or compilation or lazy evaluation. And also, I mean, you know, it's been, you know, over a decade, we can be honest, some, some design decisions in NumPy, they're just, they were just bad, and we probably shouldn't replicate them. You know, not most of them, but, but some of them are. Another thing you might say is, okay, well, what about this array function thing? This lets you sort of take NumPy functions and, and use them as like a dispatch. You can pass, you know, like a, uh, your own custom object into them and tell them, uh, like say numpy sign will will call now my library's sign function. Well, there's a few problems with this approach. Not everything's implemented in numpy. Um, there's a lot more to an array API than just function signatures. There's also things like indexing and and how does type promotion work and semantics. Um, but and, and really the biggest problem with this approach is that NumPy has forever been an array library and users really expect NumPy to be an array library and changing that to be an array dispatching tool um, is really not what people would expect when they see NumPy dot function. They really expect that to return a NumPy array. Um, and so there, there's a much better solution that we can apply here. And that's, let's create a specification for what it really means for a library to have an array API. Um, and this won't require any runtime dependencies. It won't require array libraries to know about each other at all. 
And NumPy itself is not special here. It's just another array library. Um, we can also be very uh, you know, selective when we do this and only actually specify APIs that are commonly implemented and that we can avoid things that break these important use cases like compilation. Um, and so back in May of 2020, um, the Data APIs Consortium was formed with uh, a bunch of people from various array and data frame libraries from industry, um, from these array consuming libraries and tools and end users. And uh, we all met regularly to discuss uh, standardizing this array API. And the result is the array API standard. Um, and so this uh, defines a set of functions and semantics for uh, any standards compliant array library. Um, there's no dependency on any array libraries or any library at all. It's strictly a specification. Uh, it's got about 200 functions and array methods and um, most of that is based on what's already implemented in most of the common uh, array libraries like NumPy, CuPy, PyTorch, et cetera. Uh, and so here's an example of what the specification looks like. This is the specification for the mean function. You can see it lists uh, input and output parameters, um, the uh, required D type, input D types, the output D types, the output shape. Um, there's a lot of things here that are left, intentionally left unspecified. So for example, mean, uh, the behavior on integer inputs is unspecified. Um, and the exact precision of the output is unspecified. Uh, the general principles that we tried to apply when designing this is um, we're only specifying a minimal set of behaviors. So libraries can implement more functions than what are actually included in the standard or additional keyword arguments, for example. Um, we tried to focus on APIs that are already existing. So we're not really trying to innovate here so much as just uh, create a specification based on what's already there. Uh, we, we, do, we did try to make sure that the APIs we specify support important use cases like ahead of time compilation or uh, distributed computation. So for example, uh, we avoided things like polymorphic return types. Um, mutation is uh, completely optional in the array API. Um, that we also tried to have a, a clean and consistent API. So for example, we, we uh, um, have almost all the functions in the array API are, are functions instead of methods. Um, and uh, we uh, also have very clean type signatures. So functions only accept array objects. They don't accept like array likes. Um, and then there's a lot of implementation details that are intentionally left unspecified, like the underlying storage, uh, precision and error handling. Um, in addition to the functions, uh, there's some additional semantics that are specified, um, broadcasting, indexing, type promotion. Uh, there's an in-memory interchange protocol using DLPack and um, specification for device support. Um, type promotion, uh, we specified basic numeric D types. Um, Cross kind promotion is uh, not specified, so things like promoting an integer and a float together. Um, and type promotion should work independently of array values and array shapes, so there's no value based casting. Um, I just, I'm just going to skip over uh, this slide about uh, the interchange protocol and the device support. And uh, yeah, there's, we also have some optional extensions uh, for. Uh, linear algebra and FFTs, um, because some of these may be difficult for some libraries to implement. Um, so what's the status of all of this work? Well, uh, there's been two versions released of the specification. The 2021 version was the initial release, and in 2022, we released a second version, which added support for complex number D types, uh, the FFT extension, and a few additional functions. Uh, in 2023, our focus has been on adoption, so getting libraries to support the Array API, uh, both Array libraries and um, Array consuming libraries. As far as actual Array libraries, uh, NumPy, CuPy, and PyTorch are all at about 80% compliant, um, but the plan is for full compliance. 
Uh, NumPy 2.0 in particular, the plan is to be fully compliant for that. Um, that may require a few small backwards incompatible changes, but um, yeah, and PyTorch also the plan is to, for that to be as compliant as well. JAX and Dask Array uh, are, have in progress implementations, um, but I want to stress here that for practical purposes, um, you can actually use the Array API today because of this compatibility layer, which I will go over a little bit more later. Um, adoption. Um, adoption has been happening, so SciPy and Scikit-Learn are both actively moving to adopt the Array API, as you may have heard in the um, earlier tools uh, session talks. Uh, Scikit-Learn 1.3 has experimental support in their linear discriminant analysis uh, function. Um, many other libraries are also working to adopt the Array API. Um, and so uh, if you want to chat about adopting Array API, uh, please come to my sprint this weekend. And so how hard is it to actually take a library like SciPy or Scikit-Learn and adopt the Array API into it and convert it to use uh, from using NumPy to actually being uh, Array API compliant? Um, and so we can look at uh, the Scikit-Learn pull request that added support to linear discriminant analysis by Thomas Fan uh, as an example. Um, and so here's a, a little bit from the diff of that pull request. Um, and I'll let you read sort of the, the nitty gritty details, but uh, sort of the, the high level takeaway here is um, you have to change NP to uh, XP, where XP is just you know whatever the array library is for your input arrays. And then there's a bunch of sort of little uh, things that you have to do for portability. So for example, uh, the dot function is not part of the specification, so um, it needed to be changed here to using the MATML operator instead. Um, or, for example, here that it was using STD as a, an array method, but in the array API we use uh, functions instead of methods, so that, that needed to be changed. Um, the, the big answer here is it's actually not too bad. So the biggest change is changing imports, obviously. Uh, instead of import NumPy as NP, uh, you use this XP equals array namespace X, um, where this array namespace function will uh, return the appropriate array API compliant namespace for your input object X. Uh, and then just a few cleanups uh, for portability. The standard mostly looks like NumPy already, so it's not uh, too different. And there's also a minimal implementation, which I'll go over a little more later, that really helps uh, for testing and making sure that your, uh, your code is actually using portable stuff. Um, and then the end result here is uh, now this linear and discriminant analysis function is way faster than NumPy if you use uh, KuPy or PyTorch. So you can see here even PyTorch uh, the CPU implementation is about two times faster than NumPy. Um, and then obviously depending on hardware, but you know, GPU uh, way faster, like 40 times faster. Um, and this is what the code looks like as a user. Basically, instead of using a NumPy array, you use uh, say a torch tensor. And um, everything else is the same. You pass it in to the API just as you would NumPy. Uh, so, um, in addition to uh, the specification itself, uh, we also uh, have built some tooling to help with uh, people adoption. And so there's three big pieces of tooling that we've built. Um, the first uh, that I want to go over is the compatibility layer, which I mentioned earlier. And so this is uh, what you're going to be using right now if you want to actually use the Array API as a, an Array consumer. Um, this is just a, a small library that wraps uh, the various uh, Array libraries to sort of clean up the little differences that exist between them and the specification. So for example, uh, uh, the specification uses concat, um, and NumPy calls it concatenate. Uh, and so the array API compat.numpy uh, has a concat wrapper that just wraps concatenate. Uh, this is a small library. It's pure Python. Um, it's vendorable. Um, it currently wraps NumPy, CuPy, and PyTorch. Uh, Dask array and JAX support should be coming soon. Um, 
this is how you use it. Uh, you basically, uh, the, your only entry port is this array namespace function that I talked about earlier. And you just plop this at the top of your function and pass it in, its inputs in, and this will give you whatever array library um, corresponds to those inputs. So here, like if x and y are NumPy arrays, then uh, xp will be uh, an array namespace that's compliant, uh, a NumPy array namespace that's compliant with uh, uh, the array API. And if they're PyTorch tensors, it'll give you uh, a type of the PyTorch namespace. Uh, the second piece of tooling is the minimal implementation. So this is in the NumPy Array API submodule. Um, this is a 100% compliant implementation of the Array API. And um, unlike other libraries like NumPy, which extend the Array API, this is a strictly minimal implementation. So anything that's not strictly required by the Array API, this is going to fail on. So you can see here, for example, um, we try to do, we try to add an N64 and a float64 array together, and um, in NumPy that would work. In the array API submodule, this fails because this is not something that um, the specification requires you to, to support. So this is not really for end users so much as for um, library developers to use this in your test suites to make sure that you're really doing portable things and you're not just happening uh, you're not just using behavior that happens to be implemented in, say, NumPy and PyTorch, but um, you know that because you tested them. But maybe it wouldn't be implemented in Jax, for example. Um, so if your code runs on NumPy.Array API, it should work on any Array API compliant library. Final piece of tooling I want to talk about is the test suite. So. Um, their standard is pretty big, about 200 functions, and then a bunch of semantics for all those functions on how they should behave. Um, we needed a way for array libraries to check how compliant they were so that they can actually go towards being fully compliant. Um, and so in order to do that, we developed a test suite um, against the standard. It's got about 1,000 tests. Um, and this has been uh, hugely helpful in getting us to actually uh, make NumPy and CuPy and PyTorch uh, and these other libraries be compliant. Um, and so, and this is also uh, the first instance that at least I'm aware of, of in the Python space of a test suite that's actually um, library independent. So this test suite, um, it doesn't target any specific library. It targets any array library. Um, and I also want to, uh, yes, yeah, so the test suite makes very heavy use of the hypothesis library. Uh, so hypothesis um, is a property-based uh, testing library. Uh, we implemented upstream support for the Ray API in hypothesis. And um, hypothesis, uh, yeah, it's a really great fit for this kind of thing because you can basically sort of translate one-to-one -one what's written in the specification into hypothesis property tests. And it's been really great for us um, because it does things like uh, it'll automatically test uh, corner cases and things like all possible combinations of, of keyword arguments. And as um, someone who's been involved in some and doing some of these uh, implementations in uh, helping num get like NumPy to uh, be compliant, it's been extremely useful and um, I think our life would be much, much harder without Hypothesis in this test suite. So I really want to thank the Hypothesis team for building such a great tool. Um, talk a little bit about methodology. Um, so, you know, how did we actually go about creating the standard? Uh, we had, uh, as I mentioned before, we, we wanted to focus on what is already existing and in use. So we only wanted to really implement things that were or standardize things that were already implemented in most array libraries and also things that were already used in the ecosystem. Uh, and so we used a, a data driven approach. We built a couple of tools to help with this. Um, the first tool we built um, uh, is a tool that uh, called Array API Comparison. 
uh, the data and source code around GitHub. And it basically, uh, what it does is it uh, takes all the different uh, signatures from the different popular array libraries and takes like a common uh, subset of those. Um, the second thing that we did was uh, we wanted to see how are how were these APIs actually used, and we wanted to drill down further than just saying like you know how often is the mean function used. We wanted to ask like how often is the mean function with this specific type signature used as opposed to the mean function with this different uh, type signature. And so we built a tool that instrumented uh, test suites of uh, common libraries like SciPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, et cetera, um, and uh, recorded all the different NumPy calls. Uh, and then um, for each uh, call, recorded what type of signature it was called with. And so here's an example. The mean function, you can see uh, when it's called uh, with a NumPy array quite commonly in all of these test suites, um, the same function called with a list of floats uh, is not done very often in the test suites. And so this sort of data helped us to understand, for instance, that it really um, is not a big deal for us to not standardize things like array likes. Um, future work, we our focus on is on adoption, as I said, and two, NumPy 2.0 um, should have full support for array API. Uh, but we want the standard to keep evolving, and so if you have any feedback uh, that you'd like to see, uh, please let us know. I didn't get to talk about it today, but there's been a similar effort going on for data frames. Uh, it's not as far along as the array effort, but um, so far there's an interchange protocol, and a data frame API is uh, in progress. And so if you want to hear more about that, please uh, see my colleague Marco Gorelli's talk at EuroSciPy later this year. Uh, I want to acknowledge all the people um, who, all the consortium members and people who made this possible. This was a, a really uh, a team effort. And I especially want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues at Quonsite who did most of the legwork and actually um, writing out the specification and uh, also building the tooling that I talked about. And finally, I want to acknowledge the uh, sponsors uh, for the uh, Data APIs Consortium. Uh, so your feedback is welcome. Uh, the best place to give feedback is on the Array API issue tracker. Um, contributions are also welcome. Uh, the best place to contribute right now is to help different libraries with adoption. Um, I am going to be sprinting this weekend on Array API, so if you have any questions, if you want help with, uh, to use, start using the Array API, please come to my sprints. Um, and then, uh, yeah, also if you want to learn more, uh, see our proceedings paper for the SciPy proceedings, which um, if anyone was wondering why this talk has like 20 different people listed on it, uh, it's because they made us do that for the proceedings paper because we wanted to list a bunch of authors on there. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, yeah, here's some important links to the slides, uh, to the standard, and uh, to the issue tracker for feedback. Thank you, Aaron, for a great talk. Are there any questions? Yes. Hi, that's very cool stuff. Um, I had a question, and it might not be directly related to the API standard, but I've seen a lot of programs that have that use MPI for Pi, and they do like things like reduction of NumPy arrays, and you just pass a NumPy array in, and it gets summed, for example, across all the different processes. Could you could this also be part of the array API, or is this on the radar, where you could have like a tensor instead of a NumPy array have the same result? Um, I mean, I th so I, I'm not sure if it's something that we've discussed a whole lot for standardization. Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe something like that would be something that would use the Array API instead of having to be standardized. But yeah, it would be something to, uh, if you're interested, to bring up on our uh, issue tracker. Great, thanks. Before we move on to audience questions, just want to take a couple of questions from Slack. 
So does this mean that, uh, Kyle says, asks, uh, does this mean that we will have standard keywords for methods, no more axis or dim? If so, yay. Yeah, so we did standardize on using axis as the keyword argument uh, and not dims. And, and yeah, PyTorch is, uh, now should support axis uh, and I guess in addition to dims in all of, at least all of the array API functions that it has. Is array namespace XY or, or in array namespace XY, what's the behavior if they aren't the same type? Um, I guess I'm not completely clear what the context of that is, um, but I'll, I, I can, one thing I will say is that Crop, mixing arrays from different libraries is is not something that's supported at all. So um, outside of the interchange protocol, uh, which is very explicit, and you have to do it explicitly, um, yeah. So it, right now, if if you try to say you know make one argument of a, your function a NumPy array and, and the next argument a PyTorch tensor, uh, that should be an error because it's sort of on you as as the end user to uh, you know choose what array library you're using and, and put everything in that in that same library. Could you say a little something about indexing? Like when I use your compatibility shim, so what can I ex what kind of indexing can I expect to have? Because NumPy has had so many different kinds of indexing and I'm just wondering what kind is so supported the, the, across the way all the compatibility of layer works is it it only it only wraps what's like the functions to make things compatible, it doesn't change the underlying array objects. So if you get a NumPy array, you, it'll just still be a NumPy array and you could, you could index it. As far as what indexing is actually gonna be portable and will work across libraries, yeah, so we, we don't, um, we, we, for like the normal like integer and slicing, that's, um, that's pretty much gonna be the same. Uh, there are some limitations on like uh, Boolean array indexing, we only right now support that as a single index. Uh, we don't yet have support for uh, integer array indexing that, that may or may not be added at some point. Um, and also, like I mentioned, uh, mutation is sort of an optional feature. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't write code that relies on uh, uh, sort of mutating alias arrays. Hi. Uh, thanks for all your work on this. Uh, in the X-Array team, then we've had to deal with this problem of wrapping different array types for a long time. And thanks to this effort, we've been able to get rid of like hundreds, if not thousands of lines of internal like wrapper code. Um, my question is about chunk distributed arrays. So I gave a lightning talk on Wednesday that presented like a prototype alternative to Dask Array, but Dask has some additional attributes that aren't present on like NumPy like array, specifically like you have to know what the chunks are. Um, and I, I'm just wondering whether some kind of additional namespace, like you showed the FFT namespace, for example, would it be in possibly plausible to have like a dot chunked namespace that like for extra methods for distributed chunked arrays maybe? Uh, I mean, you could definitely open an issue to discuss that. Okay. The, the big question is whether, is that something that the libraries that are like the scikit-learns and the scipies need to think about, or is it something that an end user thinks about? Because if it's something that only end users think about, that's typically something that we, we don't standardize. We're, the standard is focused on consuming libraries so that like the scipies and the scikit-learns can uh, target different array libraries. So for, for another example is that we, we, there's no, currently no, nothing specified about how to uh, like um, spe specify a specific device. Um, the device support is, is just like getting a device from an already existing array object because that's typically something that the end user will do. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, so for writing array consuming functions, I liked the, uh, the NumPy minimal implementation namespace that you can use to test your code. Um, is there any support for typing so that I can put like a, a type that describes the, the minimal uh, array API interface? So it, there's some, we do have type hints on there. I, I don't know if they've been like super well tested with actual like type checkers. Um, the, there is actually some work on making like an array protocol for the like the array object that hasn't happened yet, but there's there's some work there if you search 
the SISU tracker, you can find the relevant thing there.